Well, good morning, new home. Ain't it great to be in God's house today? It's just a blessing just to be able to be around God's people and just to see what God has for us today. Um, some of you may not know me. Uh, my name's uh, Matthew Kittle. Um, I actually work over at Cameron Boys Camp. I'm a chief over there. I, I thought about when Pastor asked me what they should put in the bulletin, I thought about putting chief, but I thought somebody, I'd get some weird looks from people. But what I do is I, I spend five days a week out in the woods with, I have a group now of six, eight to 12 year olds. They're some of the most uh, courageous boys I've ever met. Because they came to camp and they decided that they wanted to work on some things. And they decided that they're gonna, they want to change their lives. And it's good to, it's, it's awesome to be able to work with kids that have decided that they don't want what their parents had. They don't want what this world has given them. Because a lot of them have given, been given a, a hard rap. They've given, a lot of people have given up on them and said, I can't work, we can't work with these kids no more. Uh, several kids I work with have been, they've been kicked out of a couple schools just for their behavior or just different things that they've done. But, um, but we get to go and do some really awesome stuff. Uh, we just came back yesterday from a six-day lake trip at Lake Marion down in South Carolina where we got to camp on an island and just really enjoy God's nature and be able to get close to God. And that was a blessing for me and a blessing for my boys to see them open up. I had a couple boys this week even start talking talking, wanted to talk to me about God, and it was awesome to see God move in these lives, or to see the hope of Christ in lives where they may not have ever heard the gospel, because these kids, they got, they had a bad roll of the dice, to put it, to put it bluntly, but uh, one, of the big, one of the big problems we have at camp is that these kids like to argue, they like to make their point, no matter what. And what we call this is we get into power struggle. We're like, I'm going to be right no matter what. Even if I'm wrong, I'm going to be right. And I think unfortunately us as Christians can get into power struggles with other Christians and think we're going to be right on this no matter what. We're going to make sure that they know that I'm right and they're wrong. Even if, even if God's Word says something totally different. And... Um, Today we're going to be going in 2 Timothy 2. We're going to be looking at a passage and we're, I just want us to kind of we're going to kind of just go through it and see what God has for us today. Um, so 2 Timothy 2, we're going to start in verse 14. It says, Remind them of these things, charging them before God not to fight about words. That, that is in no way profitable and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not to need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth, but avoid irreverent empty speech, for this will produce an even greater measure of godlessness, and their word will spread like gangrene, among whom are Hermenius and Fallacius. They're, they have deviated from, truth, from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and are over, overturning the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, having this inscription, the Lord knows those are His, and everyone who names the name of the Lord must turn away from unrighteousness. And now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver bowls, but also those of wood and earthenware, some for special use, some for ordinary. So if anyone purifies himself from these things, he will be a special instrument, set apart, useful to the Master, prepared, prepared for every good work. Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, but reject foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they breed quarrels. The Lord's slave must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance to know the truth. Then they, then they may come to their senses and escape the devil's trap, having been captured by him to do his will. Let's pray. Dear God, I just want to just... Thank you for your word, God. Man, God, that challenges us, God, to live totally different from what this world calls us to be, God. Man, God, you're so good to us, God. Man, I just thank you for your blessings, God. 
just for you, man, God. You come close to us, God, when we, when we need you, God. I just thank you for who you are and what you've been doing for us, God. I just ask God as we go through your word today, God, that, man, your words will come out, God. It will not be me, God, that speaks, but it will be you. God, just, man, God, just thank you for how good you are, God. Man, God, even in the tough times, you're, you're right there with us, battling with us, God. I just thank you for that, God. In Jesus' name, amen. And as I thought about this, um, I look back to one of our, one of this country's forefathers, William Penn. He had a great quote about getting, uh, getting into quarrels and arguments and just different stuff that it has no value. It says, avoid company where it's not profitable or necessary. And in those occasions, speak little and last. Silence is wisdom where speaking is folly and always safe. Some are foolish as to interpret and anticipate those that speak instead of hearing and thinking before they answer, which is uncivil as well as silly. Thou thinkest twice before thou speakest once. Thou wilt speak twice the better for it. Better to say nothing than not to the purpose, and to speak pertinently. Consider both what is fur and what is fit. To speak in all debates, let truth be thy aim, not victory or unjust interest, and endeavor to gain rather than to expose thy antagonist. And as, we, as I was going through this, this passage, um, I noticed four reminders that Paul gives to Timothy, and I think that the lineup to with us as Christians today. The first is that he gives, in verse 14 and 15, he gives us a reminder to not fall into the trap of arguing about these foolish things and foolish words. Because in no way is it profitable to the hearer or the speaker, and it leads to damage being done. When we get into these arguments over things that really aren't that big of a deal, we think that I'm going to make sure that this guy knows I'm right, or this person knows I'm right, it can lead to. Even in the, my boys' lives, it's led to destruction of their house because they've, their parents have decided they're going to live this way no matter what, no matter what anybody tells them. They're going to do it how they want to do it no matter what. And when one will not, two cannot quarrel. When an argument flares up, the wise man quenches it with silence. We don't feed into these arguments that the devil tries to get us ensnared in in the church or in our lives because, you know, the devil's like, man, I'm going to get him. I'm going to put him in the situation where he feels like he has to argue, where he has to feel like he has to defend himself. And then and instead of just letting God take care of it, we, th- we think, I got this. Instead of saying, i got to step back, i got to be silent, i got to let God handle this. And we do this so that we can pre- present ourselves approved before God. The first thing that Paul says is that we have that we do this so that we can be ones that don't have to be ashamed. We don't have to feel bad about how we interacted with this person because we don't have to be ashamed because of, we allowed ourselves to learn to control our mouths. And also so we can be those that teach the truth. And also so we can be useful for God's service. Because if we're getting stuck in all these crazy arguments and fighting about just different things that at the end of the day don't really matter, we can easily fall into the trap of not being useful for God because we're over here trying to make sure that they know I'm right. Um, and you know, I think we can fall into that in the church when we, you know, we get into arguments over very s- small things things over, you know, like when I was in seminary, we had this ongoing argument. I didn't, I thought it was a fun, it was funny just because I thought these guys were idiots for arguing over it, but they, everybody wanted to argue about whether it's, uh, I'm going to use the, the fancy words, but all millennial or, or the millennial reign of God. They wanted to argue about over that. I'm like, why are you arguing over that when we got people going to hell? Why are we so worried about making sure that we get this one little section, this one thing, this our pet doctrine right, instead of worrying about those people out here, out the people out there that need us to help them, that need us to bless them? 
So the first thing that Paul, char- that Paul challenges us with is that we, he reminds us not to fall into the trap of arguing with others. The second thing, in verses 16 through 19, he reminds us to be on guard against wrong teaching. And it says, But avoid irreverent, empty speech, for this will produce an even greater measure of godlessness. So we have to be on guard against teaching that is irreverent, that doesn't give the glory to God, that takes the power of God away, or it, this, we have to be on guard. You know, the way that I see that we should be able to do this is, you know, Miss Linda always says, NIV, knows in Bible. That's how, we get, that's how we protect ourselves from falling into this trap of teaching that is irreverent or teaching that is empty speech. These, you know, these, it's very easy for us to fall into this, the pet teachings of, the, of this Christianity in general. You know, if, we're, if we're not on guard, if we're not thinking about how does this fit into the Bible instead of, okay, there's this big group that has this thing that they believe about God now, but is it really the truth? If, have I run this fil- through the filter of the Bible? Or am I just liking it because I want people around me to like me? Or are they? And this leads to greater godlessness when we allow teaching that, to, uh, teaching that is empty speech that has no point, that doesn't fit into the Bible to lead in the church. And this spreads to others. It, doesn't, it spreads like a cancer. And in the, the picture that Paul uses is in this passage is that it spreads like gangrene. Um, I made the mistake of searching for gangrene on the internet, and I saw some pictures that I don't ever want to see again. Because, and the primary cause of gangrene is reduced blood supply to the affected tissues, which results in cell death. And just in our lives, when we allow our Bible to become less and less in our lives, our Christian life begins to die. Our Christian life begins to suffer. And the only way to get rid of gangrene is to cut the affected, affected limb off. And I pray that we don't allow ourselves to get so entrapped in studying this, these things that don't really matter. We get caught up in this world that we allow our Bibles to become just a secondary source book that we look to, to if, if, I, if it gets bad enough, I'll check in with God. Or if it gets bad enough, I'll, I might check with God, but it's not going to be that big of a deal. But, oh, but in this passage, Paul gives two personal examples, Harmonious and Fallacious. They had deviated from the truth of the Gospel. They turned their back on it. They were teaching that the resurrection had already happened. And what this... What they were saying was that there was no future, future resurrection. That it happened at, that this, the resurrection the Bible talks about, they said it happened at conversion, so there was no bodily resurrection. There would be no resurrection from the dead. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. Why this is such an issue that they would be teaching this. And it says... Now if Christ is preached, is raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is without foundation, and so is, our, so is your faith. In addition, we are, found, we are found to be false witnesses about God, because we have testified about God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Therefore, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have not placed our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. So it was very important. It was a big issue that these people were causing people to fall away from the faith of the truth of God. So we have to be on guard against wrong teaching. But, God says, the truth is that in spite of people distorting the Word of God, God's truth endures. 
And God knows those who are His. And as I was thinking about this, I thought about um, back when the logging boom started. Um, every logging company would have a, a special seal that they put on the end of their log. So that the, when they ran it, down the, ran it down the river, they would know exactly which logs were theirs. And if we have given our life to Christ, God has put His seal on us that will never be re- removed. So God has sealed us with this seal. And those that are true believers will abstain from wickedness. So we will make sure that we are on guard against these wrong teachings that this world wants to to put in front of us. They want to say, no, this is a little bit different, but it sounds like Jesus, but it's not really Jesus. The way I thought about it is if if I had someone describe my mom to me, you know, you know, none of you have met her, but um, she's, if someone said, yeah, she's a, she, uh, she has black hair, she's, you know, she's white and all this good stuff, but then they say she smokes, I'm like, nope, that's not my mom. And that's the same way we should be with Jesus. That's the way we should be with God. That we should be so engulfed in the Word of God that, you know, even the devil tried that with Jesus when he tempted him. He took little portions of the Word of God to make His point, but He didn't tell the whole truth. And that's what we have to be on guard against. And also, Paul reminds us that we are to become faithful vessels. And in the church, there are vessels of honor and dishonor. And this is kind of fleshed out in Matthew 13 in the parable of the wheat and the tares where it tells about the, the farmer that went out and threw his seed on the ground. And as, his, as the plants were growing, weeds came along and they grew up within them. And the, the workers came to the farmer and they said, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to go out and try to tear out the weeds? Do you want us to go out and try to get these weeds out of your field? And the farmer was like, no, let them grow. Because if, I go out, if you go out now, you could destroy my, great, my good wheat. He said, let them grow to fruition. And then when the day comes, I will, when the harvest comes, I will separate the wheat from the tares and throw the tares into the, into the fire. And as Christians, we are to be honorable vessels. And honorable vessels are, are for honorable purposes. But to be able to do this, we must be purified from false teaching and wrong living. And 1 Corinthians 5, 6-8 talks about this. Where it says, Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast permeates the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch, since you are unleavened. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old yeast, or with the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So as Christians, we are given a personal choice on whether we want to be someone set apart for honorable purposes and be that honorable vessel for God that God can work through and change the lives of the people around us. So every day we're given that personal choice to say, am I going to be someone that wants to change this world for God? Or am I going to allow myself to become a dishonorable vessel? And it's to be someone set apart and useful for the Master. Someone that has decided that I want God to set me apart in this world. I don't want to be just like everybody else, doing the same thing, hoping I get what I want and thinking that's going to keep me happy. And to do this, we have to be, be purified. And that and purification of our lives is hard work. It's not fun. It's not easy to change our lives. It's something we have to to purify gold. You have to heat it up to a very high temperature to get the pure, to get the the dross, the the impurities to come to the top. It takes work. It takes fire. It takes difficulty. But to be useful for the master, we must 
be, be willing to do that. And we have to be prepared or ready for the honor for purposes that God has for us. And we do this so that we can serve God no matter what. And the, the dishonorable vessels are for dishonorable purposes. Um, in, a, in a house where the, this kind of talks about um, dishonorable vessels were, were used for trash and excrement. They were used for just the things that nobody wanted. But their actions show that they are dishonorable. Our actions will show whether we're honorable or dishonorable. Not what we do on Sunday morning, but what we do during the week will show. The first thing is that they indulge in foolish arguments. They decide that they're going to make this person know that they're right. Or they produce and become a part of quarrels. Or they are prideful and have the wrong motives. They want to make sure this person knows that I'm better or whatever. And the last thing that Paul reminds us is, is of how Christians should act. In verses 23 through 26. The first thing is that the qualities of Christian are that we should be gentle to all, friends or foe. This isn't easy, this is difficult. You know, it's difficult for me to be want to be gentle to a boy when he's cussing at me, or when he's just want, being a, being crazy. You know, when he just wants to do his own thing and he doesn't want to help us out. But you know, that's when we show the true quality of Christ that is in us, and we must be able to teach the truth with correct motives. We don't want to wish. We should be able to teach the Word of God with a motive of, I want to help you out. I want to care about you. Not, I'm going to show that, you, that you're wrong. I'm going to make you feel bad. And we must be able to endure being mistreated without becoming anchor, angry. And we must be patient with others. So, when, when, when those people tell us that this Christianity stuff is a waste of time. That it that it's just dumb that we give our lives to it. We have to be able to. We we must be able to not become angry and want to get back at them. It's like, yeah, that's what I believe. But I'm not gonna be rude to you. I'm gonna treat you like I would want to be treated. And Paul gives us some things that we are called to do instead of arguing, or as I call it, rock throwing. We have to be able to treat others with gentleness when they want to get into a big argument about God, when they want to make it something that's not building up but tearing down. We must treat them with gentleness. And we must be able to take the time to show them the truth. It takes hard work to, to want to help these people that are mean and nasty to us. But we must take the time to show them the truth. Because we understand that the devil has tricked them. It's not their fault that they're just crazy and they think this Christianity is a waste of time. The devil's tricked them. And we have to have, the, we have, to have that in mind when people are rude to us when they slam the door in our face. Or when they tell us, no, I don't want to hear about that. Jesus, that's a waste of time. And we do this so that they will no longer be a slave to their sin. We do this so they no longer have this weight of sin on their shoulders anymore. But they have the freedom that we've received through Christ. And we also do this so that they can become an honorable vessel while they still can. So Paul gives us four reminders in this passage. The first is that we are not to fall into the trap of arguing with others. The second is that we are to be on guard against wrong teaching. Third, he gives us a reminder to become faithful vessels and a reminder of how Christians should act. And two things would prevent more many a quarrel. First, to make sure we are not disputing about terms rather than facts. Second, to examine if the difference, if the difference of opinion is worth contending about. 
something my dad's always told me is that, is this a hill you're willing to die on? And we have to be willing to think of that in our lives. Is this, in the, within the church, is this a hill willing, that I'm willing to die on? And if it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's a hill I'm willing to die on. Or the, the, there's a teaching that I've read about that people say that Jesus was just a historical figure, that he wasn't the Son of God. That's a hill I'm willing to die on. So what are the hills you're willing to die on? So are you debating for the right reasons or so that you look good to impress the people that are around you? And also the last thing we have to make sure that we're not doing is replacing the Word of God with a preference. So everything we, we, we think about, everything we, we look at about God is are we allowing our preferences to replace what the Word of God says? Because there's some things in the Bible that are hard for me to read because I can't, because I have so much trouble living up to it. Or I'm like, man, God, really? But I have to say, yeah, that's what God says. I believe it. I'm going to go with it. You know? I think a lot of the problems we get into is that we replace the Word of God with a preference. So, this morning, I want to challenge you to think. Are you allowing yourself to get caught up in these different quarrels and arguments about things of God that are just a preference instead of just the Word of God? Are you allowing yourself to get so engulfed with the Word of God that you know when someone says something or some fancy preacher on TV or something, whoever says it in your life, says something, and you're like, ooh, that doesn't sound right, but I'm going to go look at the Word of God so that I know for certain that that is what the Word of God says. Instead of just allowing ourselves to be engulfed with, yeah, that's a really cool teaching. That's a really cool thing. I never thought of it that way. And then we forget to go to God's Word and fil- run it through that filter. Is your life running through the filter of God? The Word of God. Does that permeate so much in your life that no matter what, no matter what anybody says, that's going to be your baseline. So, trying to, but um, I want to challenge you this morning to really think and pray about what God has said to you this morning. I'm not sure what He has said to each one of you, but I pray that God's Word has challenged you. It challenged me all week as I looked at it. And I have to think about, man, is this really something I should be arguing about? Is this really something I should be allowing myself to get caught up in? So as Reed comes up and gives our invitation, I just want to just ask that you think, man, and pray and ask God to really challenge you this week about what we're allowing ourselves to get caught up in, what we're allowing ourselves to be the baseline of our lives. Okay, let's all stand. We're going to turn to page 308. Page 308.
Thank you all for coming this morning. And just, yeah, I just hope that, pray that God blesses you this week. Um, we, we have an evening service tonight at 6, if you're invited to. Um, so uh, I want to just thank you all for coming. And just, man, it's good to be in the Lord's house. So let's pray. Okay. Dear God, I just want to just thank you for just who you are, God. Thank you for your word, God. That Challenges us, God. That, that just, man, God, that just changes all all the time, God. That hits us at different points in our lives, different ways, God. I just thank you for that, God. That, man, your God, your word is not stagnant, but is living and alive, God. I just thank you for that, God. And God, as we go out, God, let us be people of your word, God. That let your word be our filter, God. Man, God, just thank you for this church. God, and the blessing that it is, God, in Jesus' name.